Hi, I hope that everybody has uh, enjoyed their coffee break. My name is Shobha Vadrevo, and I will be uh, moderating this panel on theorizing social change and media. We've got uh, three very interesting papers up today. Uh, the first one is um, Arab Democracy in the Rhetorical Public Sphere, a Revised Framework for Analysis by Assistant Professor Fahad al Sumait. Uh, then Digital Contention, a Pre- and Post-Arab Uprising Perspective by uh, Associate Professor Mohammed Zayani. And um, is entertainment really political? Global TV entertainment and social change in Egypt by Professor Kai Hafez and Assistant Professor Anne Gruner. Uh, we'll start with um, with the first with the first paper. Uh, Professor uh, Al Sumait is Assistant Professor of Communication and Department Chair at the Gulf University for Science and Technology. Uh, where he also serves as an advisor to the Vice President of Academic Services. He holds an MA and PhD, both in communication from the University of New Mexico and the University of Washington, respectively. Uh, he's got quite a few notable publications, including State Power 2.0, Authoritarian Entrenchment and Political Engagement Worldwide, uh, and is a co-editor of the Arab Uprisings, Catalysts, Dynamics and Trajectories, and Covering Bin Laden, Global Media and the World's Most Wanted Man. Uh, Professor uh, Al Sumait's paper is about um, looking at, uh, uh, I think, the issue of um, the rhetorical public sphere, that it's not uh, a normal view of the public sphere, and I think it's going to be something interesting. I will leave him to, to present it. Professor Al Sumait, please. Thank you. Thank you to MEI for organizing this conference and having us all here and for putting me on such an esteemed panel. A slight correction on my, uh, on my um, introduction there. State Power 2.0, while I'd like to take credit from Phil Hauer and, and Muzum El Hussein, uh, I only wrote a chapter for that book, not the whole thing. Um, all right, so today I'm going to talk about something called the rhetorical public sphere, which is sort of a uh, reworking of the Habermasian notion of a public sphere in a way that I think is much more applicable uh, to the Middle East. Um, and so let me start by talking about why. Uh, those of you who have thought about the public sphere in an Arab context, for example, um, probably read works like uh, Mark Lynch or, or others, uh, and have seen both the limitations and the utility of a public sphere theory, uh, but more limitations, I think, than utility. And I'd like to switch the focus more on the aspects of public sphere theory that are applicable in a non-democratic context. Um, and I want to do this because I think that we need to continue working on developing a better understanding of uh, perceptions, attitudes, will formation uh, within a Middle Eastern context, um, and understand how those are related to things like state behavior and policy. Uh, now, the, the approach that I'm recommending here uh, is one that sort of uh, complements and integrates good work that's already being done in these areas. I mean, there is work, for example, by uh, Mark Tesler in public opinion uh, and the Arab barometer that's quite good. Uh, there are many people in this room and elsewhere doing great media analysis in the region. Uh, there's a lot of ethnographic work, political analysis, et cetera. Uh, and I think that this approach to the public sphere that I'm going to talk about today is one that complements and in many ways can integrate these disparate conversations. Uh, at least that's what I'd like to think. Um, it refocuses public sphere debates in a way that uh, a public sphere is thought about as something where it's formed around a particular topic or a concept and not based in a particular institution. It's not something like uh, based off of a bourgeois public sphere or you know a particular class or particular types of people. Uh, it really has more to do with the way that we utilize discourse on certain topics to gain a better understanding of those topics and in a sense, influence uh, those around us, including people who make policy. Um, and this is uh, sort of, I'll talk about how this relates to Habermas in a little bit, but we're getting out of the democratic context. And again, this is one of the stumbling points when we try and apply traditional public sphere theory, is 
people will ask, well, where is the outcome? Uh, if you are talking about deliberation, for example, in the United States or in uh, in Europe in the 17th and eight, or the 18th and 19th century, we can see a democratic context in which debates actually lead to policy changes. But uh, in the Middle East, not always so straightforward. So that's why I recommend this revised version. And I think it's more reflective of how people talk about and understand concepts uh, in a way to sort of uh, provide themselves with legitimacy and create meaning. So uh, let me give you a quick preview. I'll talk a little bit about Habermas, mainly to critique him, sorry. Uh, and then I'll move into what the sort of basic outlines of the rhetorical public sphere model are before talking about how I've applied this uh, approach to look at two very disparate, uh, what I would call discursive environments, the United States and Kuwait, uh, as they relate to one topic, which is the topic of Arab democratization. Um, I'll give a few tentative conclusions and then talk about where I think all this can go. So let's uh, start with Habermas. Why are we talking about the public sphere, especially if uh, I've just described some of the limitations? Well, uh, because there's something very compelling about uh, public sphere theory, the Habermasian notion or others, and that is um, it gives us sort of a normative ideal against which to compare actual practices. So in a Habermasian notion, we can say, well, this is what deliberation and debate should look like, and then we can look at, say, uh, England and, and, and try and decide how much of a public sphere is actually going on there. Um, uh, in Habermas's notion, he talks about the decline of the public sphere, about we used to have this great public sphere and uh, there's been a structural transformation due to mass culture and, and so we're seeing a denigration. And so his ideal is here and reality is here and it gives us some way of trying to think about where we could be in a democratic context. Uh, another great little nugget out of Habermas is that it helps us focus on the link between uh, sort of public communication, how we talk about things and how politics actually operate. So sort of that communicative link. Uh, it gives us a framework for analyzing interactions between groups like civil society and the media, uh, as well as other uh, state and non-state actors. Um, but the emphasis largely in the public sphere is on the non-state actors. As a matter of fact, Harvard Moss made some very distinct uh, separations between state and non-state, public, private, etc. So where Habermas focuses on how sort of public deliberation leads to policy, what I'm arguing with the rhetorical public sphere is we have public de deliberation and let's look at what does that tell us about the people engaged in the deliberation itself? Not so much what are the outcomes, but what are the inputs? So I'm kind of shifting the lens uh, a bit. And in this sense, it's more descriptive than it is predictive, uh, descriptive of people's communicative intentions rather than uh, predictive of policy outcomes. Now, uh, for those of you who have uh, studied Habermas at all, uh, you're probably familiar with many of the critiques um, surrounding him. It's a very Eurocentric, his notion of the public sphere is very Eurocentric, very idealized, very class-based. Uh, it's focused on particular institutions where, for example, the, the, the pubs and the coffee houses uh, in Europe where people can engage in these debates. Um, and we could question, uh, he talks about the need for rational critical debate where people sort of uh, put aside their differences and it's the quality of the argument rather than the ethos of the speaker that determines whether or not you get a specific outcome. Uh, how much that really happens or ever happened is maybe a question of uh, debate, but we won't get into that so much now. But all of these different uh, aspects are, are part of the complications uh, that we see in the Habermasian notion of a public sphere regardless of where we're talking about applying this, even in a democratic context. But I think when we take it into a Middle Eastern context, especially uh, the Arab Middle East, we see that, well, things are even more complicated uh, because without the presence of sort of consolidated democracy, you have things like uh, limited media, you have limited public forums for deliberation, um, you have uh, a difficult time seeing the direct links between discussions and policy outcomes, um, weak civil society, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these things make it even more difficult. Uh, but I don't want to throw out public sphere because I do think that these original ideas about the communicative intentions of actors and how this can influence behaviors and policies is still valid and worth holding on to. Um, just a couple other points to make here. Uh, I mean, uh, Mark Lynch talked about the Arab public sphere. I, I think 
talking about it in terms of a sociolinguistic grouping, much too broad, but if we start talking about specific countries, a Kuwaiti public sphere or a Saudi public sphere or a Moroccan public sphere, then it becomes too restrictive because, as we know, people don't engage in debates only within the nation state. Um, so the rhetorical public sphere refocuses uh, on the topic itself as the, the, the key principle of a public sphere. Uh, and it allows us to look at sort of transnational, what I call issue-specific publics, so groups of people engage in a debate about a particular topic uh, with the intent of, of course, influencing public perceptions, trying to gain legitimacy, and sometimes influencing the state. So what does it look like? Well, as I mentioned, it, uh, public spheres can be formed around particular topics rather than based in particular institutions or by particular classes of people. This makes it more topic and communication centric uh, for those of us who are communication or media scholars, we like that. Uh, it's uh, also something that doesn't require just specific institutions. And I think that this shifts the discussion about the public sphere away from structure and ideals and it refocuses more on content and meaning, which is really the essence when we're talking about communicative action uh, that we need to, to focus on. Um, and I think it's not just applicable to the Arab Middle East, uh, it's applicable to the rhetorical public sphere, it's applicable to non-democratic context and also democratic context. Uh, the original theory itself, which is not mine, comes from a guy named uh, Gerard Hauser, uh, as a famous rhetorician. Uh, and he applies it only in a democratic context. But I would say that if with a little retooling, it works very well in a non-democratic context. Uh, I should give the caveat here that this, um, this theory is still as I'm trying to apply it in the nascent phases. So I'm very much gonna look forward to your comments and ideas about where there are weaknesses or where you uh, think it needs some improvement. Uh, I've only applied it to two discursive environments, uh, very thoroughly, but still only two environments, and I'll talk about those environments in a minute. But before I do, let's talk about this idea about forming around topics. Because um, if I haven't put you to sleep by now, you might be thinking, well, how do we form a public sphere around topics? Why that? Well, there's a lot of research about the idea of forming around issues, specific communities. Um, just to give you an example, across multiple disciplines here, we have uh, ethnographers, we have political scientists, we have communication scholars uh, that have all f uh, had different theories related to this idea about topic-centric approaches to things. Uh, those of you in political science, for example, recognize uh, Converse. He talked about issue publics in the formation of public opinion. Uh, discourse communities, interpretive communities, speech communities, uh, bundles of topically specialized public opinion, one of my favorites, and uh, issue-specific communication communities. Uh, what these all share is the basic notion that, well, people actually form communities around particular discursive and signifying practices that we, just like in this, this room here, I mean, as we talk, we all share certain discursive uh, vocabulary. There's a certain way in which we can um, discuss things like media in the Middle East and be topically focused. Uh, and what the rhetorical public sphere does is it also extracts these basic ideas uh, and it says that really the only necessary criteria for inclusion is an interest and in, uh, in the topic, something that people will talk about. This is Hauser's uh, definition, networks of interested publics engaging in vernacular discourses on specific topics. Uh, there's a lot I'd like to unpack here, but in eight minutes and 37 seconds, it's probably not gonna happen. Uh, I've always though wanted to set up a conference where you give the speaker like 40 minutes to talk, which would be great for us as academics and terrible for the audience, I'm sure. Um, anyway, uh, one of the key things I wanna bring out of his definition though is the idea about vernacular discourses. You know, the way in which we talk on a normal everyday basis has a big impact on how we think about things. Uh, when we're talking about something like democracy, I mean, we can get engaged in academic debates, especially those of us in this room, about the nuances of what we think democracy is or isn't. But when you go out and you start talking to people on the street about what democracy is, there's a much more vernacular language associated with that, much less specialized. Um, and that vernacular language, even though it's less specialized, I think is still extremely powerful and important because it tells you something about how people really think. Um, now, uh, some of the contours uh, of a 
rhetorical public sphere. I mean, Hauser talks about these things. There's a particular degree of activity. You wouldn't just talk about, I don't know, cat toys or something where there's not going to be a lot of discussion around what makes a good cat toy. I mean, it has to be something that there will be engaged uh, degree of activity. That was obviously not a good joke, sorry. Um, there needs to be contextualized language, specific ways of understanding things, uh, particularly contoured appearance, uh, and there needs to be a relevance to some kind of an outcome or some kind of state behavior. Uh, now, uh, compared to the Habermasian notion of a public sphere, the rhetorical public sphere uh, sidesteps a lot of these sort of problems when we've seen it applied in the Middle East before. Uh, you don't have to have, I won't get into all these, you don't have to have a lot of these things uh, in place to, to follow a rhetorical public sphere, whereas in a Habermasian notion, you do need to think about bracketed uh, status differences, public-private distinctions, institutions, etc. Um, and I think maybe one of the most important contributions of rhetorical public sphere is it looks in depth at what a public sphere actually looks like. Where in the Habermasian notion, there's a lot of discussion about the idea of a public sphere, but when you start digging into it, what is actually being discussed, what is actually going on, there's not much there. Um, that is, the internal structure of what constitutes a public sphere has always been under-theorized uh, because the public sphere is such a grand theory. Whereas, if you take the rhetorical public sphere, that's exactly what you're looking at. What are the components that make up that public sphere? Uh, and those are the vernacular rhetorical environments that I talk about. Some other aspects, uh, some of the terminology that I utilize with this. Um, I talk about uh, demarcating a specific scope in terms of a, a discursive environment, because inevitably, as much as we'd all like to get away from discussions about the state, there's been that turn in political science, uh, we do inevitably talk a lot about states. And even when you're talking about rhetorical uh, public spheres, I mean, I talk about the United States and Kuwait, two state-defined boundaries. Um, but I talk about them in terms of the discursive environments, because the the, the discussions that they engage in are not confined within just a state, uh, even though we sometimes, for the issues of analysis, have to talk about states. And I talk about issues uh, that have sustained public deliberation. Um, the publics themselves are what we call issue-specific communities, as I mentioned. And unlike the Habermasian notion, I believe that people from the state are also contributing to the discourses which affect people's perceptions and the state's behavior. So I believe in both policymakers and what I call political sophisticates is constituting a rhetorical public sphere. And we can talk more about sophisticates in a while um, uh, during the Q&A. But uh, of course, uh, there has to be a media angle here since this is a conference about media. Uh, journalists in the media are very much part of uh, what I constitute within the political political sophisticates. Now in terms of what you actually look at, what are some of the units of analysis? Uh, there, there's quite a few here that I've applied uh, most of these to the work I'm going to talk to you about, and m many of you will recognize these uh, different ways of, of analyzing, uh, and I think all of them are relevant to discussions of rhetorical public sphere. So I mentioned Lynch. I just wanted to point out something about him because most of you will be much more familiar with his work than my work. Uh, you all probably know about his work on the New Arab Public, uh, which I added sphere there. Um, I think that not only was this a very significant piece of work and it helped sort of bridge international relations uh, and political science with communication and media studies, uh, but it was also important because um, uh, it focused on a particular issue that was uh, of interest to people at the time, which was Iraq. And in doing so, I think he actually sort of anachronistically applied the rhetorical public sphere theory without realizing it, because he does look at an issue-specific topic, Iraq. He incorporates multiple forms of analysis, public opinion data, media analysis, uh, interviews, etc., political analyses. And uh, he's very much focused on the transnational context. He looks a lot at Al Jazeera, for example, and its impacts. And he's discourse-oriented. And he's more focused on the citizens than the elites, which in the analysis of our region, there's still very much more of a preference toward the elites, I think, than, than the masses. Uh, of course, he didn't mean to do this as a rhetorical public sphere, but I think that his uh, study, if I can just appropriate it, actually is the kind of thing that exemplifies, ex exemplifies what I'm trying to talk about. So what does it look like when I actually apply it? 
Well, uh, I've applied it to the United States and Kuwait. These are my two sort of discursive environments. Uh, I looked at the issue of democracy or democratization, depending on whether I'm talking to academics or non-academics. Um, uh, and I picked uh, democracy. I mean, it's an uh, ideological laden term, one in which there are very sustained policy debates and one that is very uh, related to what's going on in the region. Uh, and this started, uh, of course, well, it's discussions about democracy in the Middle East have been going on for quite a while, but they certainly accelerated following September 11th. George Bush uh, started pushing the whole democracy, the freedom agenda, democracy promotion. Um, from the outside, with the Arab uprisings, we see calls for democracy uh, being a lot more common. Uh, so this is certainly something that's a significant area of discourse as an issue to focus on for the rhetorical public sphere, and one in which there are very, the very many issue-specific communities uh, in which to look at. Um, in terms of the U.S., they represent sort of the hegemon in the region, the dominant political voice, uh, voice trying to push for regional democratization, at least uh, for a while. Uh, Kuwait is sort of on the other end of the scale, but I pick Kuwait because it was it's one of the more liberalized uh, of the Middle Eastern countries, one that both the state and many of the citizens like to think of as a democracy, uh, which, of course, we can argue about. Uh, well, we probably wouldn't argue in this room, and there's no ambassador here for me to talk to. Uh, but by and large, um, it is a fairly liberalized country and one which to use as a point of comparison. Um, and I, I also think this is uh, important to contrast these two because they represent macro, micro, dominant, uh, sort of marginal, internal, external. There are many different dichotomies going on here, and yet I'd still like to show how they can be engaged uh, in some kind of... Uh, illustrative understanding of the, of the public sphere, the rhetorical public sphere around democracy. I'm running out of time, sorry. Uh, just to give you a quick idea about the samples that I use in the United States, I looked from the end of the Cold War at uh, over 2,000 different texts, presidential speeches, foreign policy journals, uh, TV broadcasts, newspapers, etc. This was a dissertation. It took me a very long time. Uh, I came up with uh, three different thematic uh, classifications dealing with the rationales behind democracy promotion, how people evaluate democracy in the, in the Arab Middle East, and what were some of their expectations. In Kuwait, I did uh, 51 in-depth interviews with political sophisticates representing uh, a range of different groups, but largely uh, grouped into three different areas, which are very porous areas, uh, Islamist uh, women's activists and liberals. And I talked to them about their impressions, ideas, and initiatives related to democracy. So, uh, probably won't get done in eight seconds, but I'm almost done. The, uh, what were some of the things? Well, there were areas of convergence and areas of divergence. There are things that we can say, okay, they see the same, and of course, more things that we can say they see differently between the discursive environment in the United States and Kuwait. Uh, in the United States, uh, for example, uh, when it comes to democratic functioning, they extolled the virtues of democracy. It's great. It's going to solve all the problems. It's a panacea. Let's bring in democracy. You, you've all heard it. Uh, in Kuwait, though, there was widespread uh, frustration with what they saw as democratic functioning in their own country, or dysfunctioning, I, I might say. Uh, and they saw that consultation impeded policy development. They started looking at Qatar and then Dubai, and they say, why are we not like that? It's because we're trying to you know, democratize. Uh, the takeaway, well, um, when it comes to recognizing and discussing uh, democracy, uh, its problems and its limitations certainly probably need more attention uh, than just its, uh, it, its positive benefits, especially if we're trying to ask, I mean, in this case, the United States, trying to ask other people to adopt it. In terms of religion and politics, just another sample of an area where I saw lots of divergence. In the U.S., in all of these different kinds of discourse I looked at, there was ardent secularism uh, when it came to democracy and Islamist phobia, uh, and some belief, uh, as you're all aware, in uh, Arab or Muslim exceptionalism, the idea that they can't have democracy over there, they're exceptional. Uh, in Kuwait, none of the people saw that. They actually saw there was no issue of compatibility between Islam and democracy, just differences in the amount of uh, Islam necessary in democracy, depending on who you ask. Uh, uh, but all of them saw that there should be some necessary marriage between Islam and politics. So again, uh, the takeaway from that is the understanding and accepting Islam is sort of a confounding factor uh, to democratization in the region is necessary. In terms of policy, just uh, another example of the kinds of findings that can come out of this. Um, the U.S. Uh, spent a lot of time talking about democracy in relation uh, to the peace process. Uh, 
and in the Arab Middle East, they also had a very short time horizon in terms of how quick should we expect democracy to start providing benefits. Um, and there were many that saw that democratic uh, change might be a little tenuous and especially nowadays unpredictable. In Kuwait, that was a bit different. Peace process was not even an issue of dis public debate and discussion. Uh, so you can see there's two very different things going on there. Uh, the longer time horizon uh, when it comes to what it takes for democracy to consolidate. And uh, most of the Kuwaitis I saw not only thought that they were in a democracy, but they thought that democracy was both uh, possible and likely uh, to occur in the region just on a much longer time frame than most Americans did. So again, disentangling the peace process from democracy promotion, spreading time horizons, these are some of the kinds of outcomes. Now, there were areas of convergence. Uh, for one, um, when it came to issues like uh, human rights, constitutionalism, liberties, uh, social justice, freedoms, uh, whether we're talking in the United States or we're talking about the discourses in Kuwait, these were essential ideas that everybody seemed to find uh, very uh, strong principles in and supported quite a bit, which gives you some indication of an area of common ground on which um, international dialogue can happen. Uh, both sides saw that democracy holds the promise of uh, cultivating pluralism, uh, moderating against violence over the long term. Uh, both of them saw shared optimism uh, about the role of, of new media in democratizing, which is a theme that's come up already in this, uh, in this conference and will come up in the other panels as well. Uh, and both of them also evidenced the ret rhetorical flexibility of the concept of democracy. That is, they all employed democracy for their own ends, even though they often had very uh, divergent understandings. Um, uh, to give an example, in, in the United States, I saw over the course of many years, uh, presidents uh, extolling democracy uh, for ex exactly opposite ends. Uh, in Kuwait, they do the same thing. The Islamists will talk about how democracy is very much a part of their agenda, the same way liberals will, and both of them will claim neither knows what the other, what democracy is. Um, so, uh, some future directions here. Uh, I would like to uh, expand this. I mean, I was conducting most of this research during the uh, beginning of the Arab uprisings. I'd very much like to see how respondents uh, view this and how uh, the U.S. media, in a systematic way, discusses democracy in a post-uprising context. I'd also like to add uh, more units of analysis to my own uh, and then eventually expand this to look at other parts, uh, other Arab countries, uh, to determine how the rhetorical public sphere is contoured in different locations. Um, and I need to wrap up. Uh, I, finally, I'll just say that I'm very interested uh, in hearing your feedback about this, whether or not any of this made sense, what kind of uh, holes or gaps you see, or any other comments you might have that will help me sort of critique and refine the public sphere model, the rhetorical public sphere model. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think we're going to have to try to keep to the time so there's more time to ask questions about this fascinating model later. Um, I'll now call upon uh, Associate Professor Mohammed Zayani, who is uh, with the uh, Professor of Critical Theory at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in Qatar. Um, he's the author of Network Publics and Digital Contention. Uh, as well as the Al Jazeera phenomenon and the culture of Al Jazeera to talk about digital contention, a pre- and post-Arab uprising perspective. Professor Zayani, please. Thank you for the introduction, for the center to, to uh, host this uh, stimulated conference. Uh, my talk is focused on uh, my book, which just came out. It's called Network Publics and Digital Contention, The Politics of Everyday Life in Tunisia. Uh, it was published by Oxford University Press under their series, the Oxford series in digital politics. Uh, what I would like to do is give you a taste of the theoretical issues I try to grapple with, and I'll be happy to elaborate uh, more in the Q&A session on the case studies. Um, how can I turn this light on? Turn the light on. 
It's all right, uh, but I'll claim my minutes back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no account of the Arab uprisings is complete without reference to digital activism. In the popular imagination and in academic circles alike, the momentous changes Arab countries witness it over the past few years were intimately connected to an unprecedented media momentum that fueled what Castell calls networked outrage, networks of outrage and hope, forced a number of dictators out of power and altered what seemed to be an immutable political reality, at least until it led to some more complicated developments over the past uh, uh, two or three years. The relationship between communication technology revolutionary dynamics, political activism, and social movements sparked interest in the, in the implications that digital media and social networks have for political dissent, collective action, and street politics. They represent they presu the presumed relationship between citizen-led action and the adoption of a wide range of communication tools and information technologies gave media in the Arab world an added, if not a new relevance. Now, this judgment about the centrality of technology and technological innovation to political change in the Arab world stands in marked contrast to the predominant narrative of only a few years back, that is pre-2010, which emphasized the region's aversion to change. Although the advent of transnational television in the 1990s and the widespread of and the widespread adoption of the internet in recent years undermined the hegemonic control of Arab governments over information. Such transformation appeared to be politically inconsequential in the face of the region's entrenched authoritarianism. Nor for that matter had digitally networked technologies and participatory media paid democratic dividends for a region that had long been marked by non-participatory political systems. At best, the vibrant Arab media scene was deemed by some scholars to have created a space of interaction that is akin to what Habermas calls the public uh, sphere. Even so, the energized Arab media sphere helped break the state monopoly over public discourse, and the new culture of connectivity helped democratize the right to access information. The effect on the region's political culture remained constrained to a large extent. So those are the two stories. Neither the story of the technology-enabled revolution, revolutions toppling Arab dictators and bringing in sweeping political changes, nor the narrative of authoritarian rulers determinately controlling information and stifling online dissent provide a nuanced understanding of the media experience in the MENA region. Although the energized Arab media environment and increased access to ICT has attracted attention in academic and policy circle. The, foc the focus has been all, um, all over on the political effects of media. Now, underlying these formulations is an analytical perspective that focuses almost exclusively on the political effects of media, which leaves aside significant dynamics that pertain to the complex ways in which media have been experienced, adopted, appropriated, and used within the particular context of a rapidly changing Arab world. Capturing the intricacies of these mediated experiences requires a better understanding of the processes that have shaped the media usage over the years. In particular, the significance of the communication possibilities, the adoption of new information communication technologies affords for imagining and negotiating one's lived existence as subjects in the region. When considering the MENA region's reconfigured communication space, a number of questions beg for understanding. How are the mediated socio-cultural practices that emerged in recent years at the intersection of the real and the virtual worlds, how are they affecting agency? How is the changing communication culture altering subjectivity? How do forms of online engagement bear on identity negotiation? And how are communication practices that have 
that are embedded in social networks, redefining practices of politics and the, mean, the very meaning of citizenship. What I'm proposing in this project is a political sociology of the media in the region. <coughs> and I anchor my, 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 my study in the case of Tunisia being the first uh, case um, in the Arab uprisings. Now, uh, a few years ago, I experimented with uh, 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 cultural anthropology. I became uh, very attracted to cultural anthropology. Uh, uh, I think over the past six or seven years, very interesting, uh, unique contributions to Arab media that remain, unfortunately, on the margin, emerge from people who are not in communication per se, but they are in, in anthropology. So they are not really media specialists. They happen to work on Egypt, therefore they, 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 they focus on, on Egypt. And uh, I can name uh, four or five of the uh, 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 I mean, uh, their work is well known. Charles Hirschkind, Leila Boulogd, Carissa Salamandra, Walter uh, 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 Armbrust. Uh, uh, outside that uh, anthropological uh, circle, there are only very, very few attempts to 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 bring uh, cultural anthropology to bear on on the on 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 the the, the study of Arab media. And one of the very few works is the work of 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 Nah uh, of. Uh, 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 Noha Moller on, on, on let's look at, at the background, of the, the very background of, of, of those who produce the news. So looking behind the scenes, not at, at, at let's look at who, uh, who is it that is, that is producing uh, those news. That, that kind of backstage analysis I think is, is, is missing and that's one of the things that I think I try to, uh, 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 to bring here. What I, what I try to bring to focus is the intricate relationship of digital culture, youth activism, cyber resistance and political engagement. In essence, the book is about digital activism and online communication within the larger sociopolitical context of the authoritarian state. Uh, it explores the various modalities of online resistance that authoritarianism breeds within an increasingly intense communication environment that is conducive to new kinds of sensibilities, experiences, and actions. So in essence, the book tells the story of the co-evolution of technology and society as opposed to uh, the, the, the one directional uh, um, uh, uh, flow of uh, 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 research focus. A central, a central question motiva motivating my investigation is what happened when networked Arab publics are shut out of the political arena and an authoritarian political system? And what kind of political engagement develops? Let me now step back and contextualize this within larger uh, debates within the field. Since the outbreak of the Arab uprisings, a wealth of studies has emerged on how, why, and where Arab publics engage in collective mobilization and the modalities through which they initiate various forms of collective action. While some of these works extend old arguments about what is often conceived as ongoing technologically enabled democratization processes. Others are more interested in dynamics of social movements by digitally enabled and globally connected actors. During the early months of the Arab uprisings, many pundits hailed the centrality of media to the revolution, attributing, attributing massive importance to its role in circulating information, raising consciousness, and coordinating protests. Deeming social media as a, as a potent force, a cause of action, a game changer, they effusively described the events in Tunisia and Egypt as a social media revolution portraying Facebook and Twitter as engines of regime change and political transformations. For a few weeks, a narrative that developed that explained what happened in parts of the Arab world as being an information technology induced political change. That narrative reflects a tendency among communication technology optimists and digital, digital enthusiasts to champion the emancipatory potential of technology. Their position recalls uh, the classic work of Daniel Lerner, The Passing of Traditional Society, which considers mass media as a driver of economic and political modernization. Some of the more recent accounts see new media technologies as engines for political change and enablers of democratization. By eroding government's ability to control information, the argument goes, new communication technologies have helped build a freer and more open society. Increasingly, this narrative holds the emergence of new digital spaces for dissent and the intensification of online struggles are becoming a source of challenge to closed political systems. By enhancing the ability 
people's ability to organize protests, coordinate actions, synchronize movements, disseminate information, share video footage, and amplify events. Increasingly affordable communication technologies are viewed as helping people and their authoritarian systems acquire, quote, a net advantage. Not everyone shares this the view of the technology enthusiasts, though. For skeptics, reducing social movements to immediate effect smacks of a technological determinism. Some analysts have argued that the connectivity to interactive social network tools and media platforms during times of unrest and protests could hinder rather than exacerbate collective action. There is interesting work on what happened when Mubarak shut off the, the, the internet. As many uh, have commented, the ease of sharing a new story on social networks means that such gesture is not genuine activism, but a form of slacktivism or collectivism. Arguing against the internet freedom agenda scholars like, uh, uh, that scholars like Shirky espouse, Morozov labels the idea of media t uh, of that media technologies are driving revolts and that governments are made vulnerable by technology-enabled citizens as a form of cyber-utopianism. For him, the internet is not spreading freedom, but is making it easy for governments to monitor their citizens and to track political activism, thereby, thereby enhancing their ability uh, to monitor what citizens accept, stifle dissent, and title their, tighten their grip on their societies. And mind you, there is a lot of uh, 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 work, particularly from security studies people, who, who talk about how governments are investing in all sorts of technology to be on, on, on top of this, using sophisticated data mining, data mining uh, uh, equipment to expensive surve surveillance equipment. Significantly, the views of the media skeptics and media enthusiasts alike. So, so the, the debate has been centered on these two poles, and I'm trying to move beyond this altogether. So significantly, the views of the media skeptics and media enthusiasts alike are premised on a functional or instrumentalist approach toward media that obscures the complex nature of the media use and the significance of the broader context within which media habits develop. Taking heed of these complexities calls for a reformulation of the terms of the inquiry in a way that refocuses the analysis away from causation to dynamics. That necessarily entails showing the emphasis on the instrumentalist use of the internet, treating it not so much as a tool of, to coordinate dissent and mobilize people, but as a set of practices and processes that are embedded in, ev in everyday life practices. What interests me here is not so much the politics of communication, but is not so much political communication, but the politics of communication. This, this necessitates leaving behind the comfort zone that has marked the literature on the relationship between information and communication technologies and sociopolitical change to examine the emergence and development of what I call digital spaces of contention or digital culture of contention, a term which designates an amalgam of social interactions, citizen forms of engagement, everyday cultural practices, ordinary activities and mundane pursuits that intersect with and are embedded in media experiences, are anchored in participatory networks, are, and are intertwined with processes of communication that encompass a variety of information technologies, media platforms, and communication tools. Contention emerges less in my project as, as overt dissidence or resistance, and more as a form of assertiveness. I'll be explicit later on about assertiveness of what. It invokes a set of practices, interactions, engagements, articulations, contestations, and rejections that are not necessarily politically framed. They are political otherwise. Understanding the lineaments and contours of this contentious digital space that I'm outlining calls for a histori historically grounded and theoretically informed analysis. I, I've given you the taste of the theoretical uh, part, but uh, it, it seems to me that uh, uh, current trends within uh, Arab media studies have been plagued by this sort of amnesia, meaning, meaning uh, it's as if things start 2010. And uh, uh, luckily, uh, the introduction of the internet in the Arab world dates back to 1996. That's when the first country, the first Arab country, introduced the internet. And therefore, there's a, there is a margin of 20 years. And what I did is step back and look at, at those forms of contention as they evolved, as they developed for the past uh, 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 20 years, in which case what happened in in, in, uh, in that uprising becomes one chapter and, and maybe not, not the significant ch uh, chapter. Uh, I found out that, for example, the most significant chapter was the blogging chapter, which is four, uh, three to four years before that of uprisings. 
Uh, where am I? Understanding the lineaments and contours of this digital culture calls for historically grounded and theoretically informed analysis of microprocesses, cultural practices, and societal interactions that intersect with, are embedded in media usage, production, and consumption, and are anchored in evolving trends of socialized consumption that are indissociable from everyday life experiences and practices. The unsuspected complexity of such experiences has not been, to my, uh, uh, in my view, uh, uh, has not received the attention it deserves. One notable, uh, uh, so political scientists, for example, who are interested in the Middle East, particularly from a media uh, 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 angle and, and, and otherwise, have focused on the Middle East from, from the perspective of authoritarianism. Uh, uh, some other Arab countries, for example, have been have been have been looked at by political scientists uh, for 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 say in terms of gender, but the social practices that are, that are underlying a whole underlying a whole society that is evolving has never been uh, really a, a point of strength as far as uh, the analysis of political scientists uh, uh, is concerned. One notable and very interesting uh, 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 exception is a work by. A lady called Beatrice Ibu, and, and she writes a book on Tunisia called *The Force of Obedience*, in which she looks at uh, she looks at how people obey, and what she does. She's not interested in how in in the police state in in how uh, the government imposes its will, but rather how people come to accept uh, uh, that form of of of, of uh, uh, authoritarianism. Uh, Ibu sheds light on everyday what she calls everyday domination, the ways techniques of of discipline are woven, woven into everyday social uh, practices. Uh uh, using uh, using a Foucaultian uh, perspective, Hebu reinscribes power and the analysis of power within productive apparatuses ensconced in the realm of everyday life, rather than associ uh, associate them with localizable repressive institutions. Um, Insightful as it may be, Hibu's work is more, and, and now I'm going to try to show the limits even of work, uh, avant-garde work uh, such as this. Insightful as it may be, Hibu's work is more concerned with the application of power and the processes through which subjects are constituted than the, subject, uh, the subjective potential subjects develop under such system. Although the account she offers pays particular attention to tensions and small-scale confrontations in everyday life by everyday actors that render control more utopian than real, it nonetheless affirms the prevalence of the forces of obedience. So her book is not called The Force of Disobedience. It's called The Force of Obedience. And therefore, uh, she is one other political scientist who, used to, who uses a very intelligent perspective only to say that authoritarianism is, is uh, the region is, is married to authoritarianism. And what I try to do is highlight or map out forces of, or, or, or um, the sediments of, of what I call uh, 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 um, contention uh, and what form they, t uh, they take. Now, this would lead me to, to redefine what is political, and that's a major theoretical uh, uh, sub-project within, uh, within this book. So, uh, the authoritarian predicament not, notwithstanding, subjection uh, did not necessarily preclude dynamics of or, or counter dynamics and disposition. Even for Foucault, uh, quote, there is no relationship of power without the means of escape. Every power relationship impl implies at least a potential, in potential, a strategy of struggle, end of, qu end of quote. This is Foucault in his post-structuralist uh, uh, contribution. These counter-dynamics are more explicitly described in Michel uh, Disserteau's The Practice of Everyday Life, particularly the way subjects negotiate their position power within a particular system. While reiterating Foucault's conceptualization of the way disciplinary technologies, productive apparatuses of power, could become e extensive and all-encompassing, Disserto also brings to light clandest, quote, clandestine forms taken by the dispersed tactical and makeshift creativity of groups or individuals already in the nets of discipline, end of quote. For Disserto, what is important to note is not simply the web of discipline that technologies of power create, but also, the, quote, the network of anti-discipline, end of quote they engender. How, in other words, how marginality 
is renegotiated and how subjects who are otherwise weak and dominated reappropriate spaces, discourses, and practices using various tactics which he dubs the art of the weak. Uh, a formulation that is echoed in the uh, classic work of James Scott, which he calls the arts of resistance. If these tactics are articulated in everyday life, it is not only because everyday life practices are tactical in essence, but because they are political in nature. In other words, in the words of Disserteau, quote, the ingenious ways in which the weak make use of the strong lend a political dimension to everyday practices. Now, this is not to say that there, are, that, 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 that there is no interesting or avant-garde work that didn't even predict what's happening. Now, uh, there are, there are uh, um, notable exceptions on the positive side. For sociologists of the Middle East, like Asf Bayet, the everyday life of ordinary people constitutes a de facto site of resistance. It breeds dynamics of change that often go unnoticed because they are associated with, quote, unconventional forms of agency and activism and articulated around alternative venues of resistance that have, been, that have um, the proclivity of reinventing prevailing norms through creative innovation. In his book, Life as Politics, Asbaya draws attention to a variety of social practices, primarily in urban settings through which ordinary people either resist or subvert domination. These social non-movements, as he calls them, interlock activism with the practice of everyday life, bringing together, quote, fragmented and inaudible collectives, end of quote and devising varied strategies of the quiet encroachment of the ordinary on the authority of the autocratic state. In the age of social media, the ability to transcend physical space, which Bayet is describing, of connecting atomized individuals on the social web is further enhanced. What is of interest for me, is not so much the propensity of everyday digital practices to generate social movements or non-movements, but the very experience of politics that everyday life tends to inscribe networked publics with, irrespective of whether they see themselves as involved in politics or not. The political dimension of the, these practices is often elusive because it is enmeshed within, precisely because it is enmeshed within everyday life practices. And here, the work of the social, French sociologist Henri Lefebvre is very useful. For, for Lefebvre, the concept of everyday life is constitutive of an intrinsic to social reality. At the same time, everyday life refers to a sense of being, to a lived experience that is hard to capture. By definition, the, the everyday is that which escapes us being mark, marked by both opacity and ambiguity. Paradoxically enough, the significance of everyday life rests precisely in its seeming insignificance. And, and that's a major component of my, my project. It's, it's practically the subtitle, The Politics of Everyday Life, uh, looking at politics uh, uh, everywhere, uh, elsewhere. Is time up? My time is up. Uh, 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 maybe one uh, 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 one comment which relates to to um, uh, uh, the need to go beyond institutional politics and, and beyond uh, one of the things that the, the the book questions is what is it that we call politics and where do we locate politics and what happens is that whenever political scientists have tried to tackle this this topic particularly within the concept of Arab media they have impoverished. Uh, there is a tendency to impoverish the notion of the political because it is constrained or it is looked at only within uh, the, the classic perspective of, of what is politics. And so one of the projects, one of the, the things I set out to do is redefine uh, the realm of, of, of the political. I invite you to know more about that in the book itself. Thank you. Thank you so much. This, this job is not a nice job, actually, of having to, you know, cut people short when they're speaking, especially when the papers are so, are so fascinating. Um, so we have now um, Professor uh, uh, Kai Hafiz and uh, Professor Anne Gruner from the University of uh, Erfurt. Erfurt? Uh, 
who will uh, be talking about their paper is entertainment really political global tv entertainment and social change in europe i think in order to give them perhaps a little more time to speak i'll cut short the the bios uh, so uh, kai hafiz is professor of international and comparative media and communication studies at the Uni university of erfurt and uh, his publications include radicalism and political reform in the islam and western worlds and Gruner is assistant professor at the University of Erfurt, um, who received her MA from the University of uh, Leipzig, Leipzig, and uh, her PhD from the University of Erfurt. So, uh, without further ado, I think I'll let them take the floor. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Uh, a few years ago. Um, I had the feeling that I was a little disappointed by developments in the Arab world. You know, you've described it this morning. Uh, Arab Spring, dashed hopes, uh, coups, however you name it. And I thought, you know, after 20 years of analyzing political journalism, I had to do something else. And I wanted to do a study on entertainment, you know, something funny. <laughs> um, get away from the uh, sincere analysis of things and I found Dr. Green a colleague of my university is an expert on popular culture and well it's a it's an effort in collaborate research and we do our best because she has a lot of experience in audience research in Egypt which is you know fine for us and what we do today is actually reflect on the anthropological as Mohammed Zayani uh, mentioned slogan entertainment is political you know a common saying entertainment is political has political side effects uh, we're not talking about um, obviously political entertainment like you know certain types of pop music hip-hop talk shows polytainment formats that is not our issue we're talking about pure entertainment even I should say capitalist entertainment to a certain degree, you know, mass, mass entertainment productions on TV. Uh, we're asking the question whether popular TV culture in the Arab world has political effects. Quiz shows, game shows, you know, things people watch actually. You've seen the one, one of our colleagues here showed uh, uh, a statistic saying that, you know, entertainment programs are still high on the interest uh, in, in the Arab world. And that is why they have effects, but we don't really know what type of effects they have. Uh, now, there is a political dimension, obviously, to pure entertainment. Uh, we can call it that we can say that, that entertainment has a meta message, it has a side message, it has a second message that is sometimes not visible straight away. You think you know the rules, you, you know the games, you think you know what you're seeing, talent shows or whatever, but there might be hidden messages behind it, you know. For example, a quiz show might transfer the hidden message of knowledge. Uh, a talent show might transfer a hidden message of individualism as a value. Uh, entertainment as such might transfer values of participation in society that can be somehow related to democratic developments I mean we were reflecting that so the, the the basic aim for us is to reflect on all that but there is a big well let's say debate about the political effects of, of media entertainment for decades uh, already it's a highly disputed field in theory and the relationship between these meta messages I call them these hidden messages on the one hand and political theory remains completely unclear and unresolved uh, and it's really because it is sometimes ill-defined and I come back to Arab studies as a field what we're trying to do is you know come up with a third first a theoretical frame uh, as, a, as a suggestion and then Dr. Grüne will try to test it on her basic of her empirical experience. The state of the art, you can see a lot of names on the board. Some of them are teachers of Habermas, Adorno, Horkheimer. Uh, these are like this is the critical school, the Frankfurt School. This is, you know, a group starting from the 40s who thought in a certain, you know, capitalist critic way coming up with uh, positive democratic theories, normative as they might be, not applicable to other countries as they might be, but still in everybody's mouth. I mean, you need them as a reflectory for your own work until today. 
there was a second wave of, you know, in the recent debate, John Fiske, uh, cultural studies, uh, and I'll come back to some of the other names. Benjamin Barber is very well known. Uh, due to time restraints, I have to be very limited. There's a controversy on whether entertainment is politically uh, around the question of the, if the individual really engages in critical thinking or is manipulated, for example, due to entertainment. Uh, whether entertainment enables cultural expression beyond the traditional elite or is a mere capitalist mass production, or whether entertainment, and this is really interesting to me as political sciences, is a form of democra democratic representation or a mere, as Graham Turner called it once, demotic, you know, from Greek demos, demotic, uh, illusion that is not has nothing to do with democracy. Now, in Arab media studies, there seems to be a very positive trend in the interpretation of entertainment and political change. Uh, Walter Ambrose, a colleague of mine from Oxford, with whom I collaborated in previous years, was mentioned. And uh, a very uh, fascinating book by Marwan Kredi, Cambridge University Press, a couple of years ago, on Arab reality TV. To, you know, you, you, these are some of the phrases Crady uh, used for the social effects, the social change effects of uh, Arab reality shows. Uh, they, uh, they show, as I quote him, what it means to be Arab and modern. They violate the boundaries of identity and authenticity at a time when the boundaries have been hardened by violence and Islamization. They blur the line between the role of the sexes. They refashion individual identities, they foster new consumer lifestyles, etc., etc. Grady criticizes a skeptical view of entertainment as having a corruptive, he quotes himself, corruptive impact on democratic life. Uh, although Grady is also hesitant when, when, you know, considering the democratic impact of reality TV, uh, he hesitates a bit. A few years before that, in the mid or around the year 2005, he was more optimistic, saying, and I quote him, that reality or that TV allows various actors to articulate competing social identities and political agendas, which, after all, seems to be the core of democratic development. So in the end, 10 years ago, Crady was arguing, if you ask me, that reality entertainment has a democratic effect in the Arab world. Now, with the Arab Spring and all the developments, high hopes dashed in a way, and I totally agree with Sahara Khamis that we are at a point where we have to re-evaluate the state of the art, uh, not only in, in you know, your field of studies, online research, but also in entertainment studies. And I come up with the first uh, little theoretical sketch here that uh, Dr. Grün is, is uh, trying to test a little later, a theoretical concept uh, is pure entertainment can have effects on political culture on various levels. That is our argument. Uh, political culture, I'm, I don't have the time to define it. It's attitudes of people, values, and opinions, to be uh, roughly speaking. It can be subdivided in three different levels. And we subdivide it in system-related uh, political culture aspect, community-related cultural aspects, and subject-related attitudes and we want to find out which of those elements are specifically impacted by entertainment on TV. Let me start, you know, to give you a little introduction theory wise in two minutes. <coughs> system related political culture, what is it? Attitudes concerning political system cannot be expected to be found in pure entertainment. There is no negotiation on political <coughs> issues as such and therefore system related political cultures and the direct participation in the political system is not possible. Might be possible in a political talk show, it's not possible in pure entertainment shows. But what you can expect to be finding, and that was Crady's argument, is that you might be finding values of civil society, for example, values of recognitions of groups representing each other. There might be a Christian standing up, you know, being uh, part of a game, and he might be representing indirectly uh, a minority group. So recognition, recognition within societies can be fostered. Representation of social groups, tolerance, you might say, might be enhanced uh, by pure entertainment. 
uh, seen from, uh, you know, a little further down from a perspective of conflict theory, you know, you have like conflict theories of Marxism, Weberianism, feminism, post-colonialism and such. Uh, pure entertainment can, uh, entertainment can be a training field for social conflict and the peaceful resolution of conflicts. You can be, you know, peaceful resolution of conflicts can be trained when seen in a fictional scenario. Although, you know, theory-wise, we never know whether we can transfer what is learned here to the political reality. But after all, I, I would summarize system-related political culture to a certain degree can be partly represented in pure entertainment. At least the recognition of social groups can be expected to be found, if not the system-related uh, political uh, representation and participation, which cannot be expected to be there. Community-based political culture, we can not only analyze entertainment shows on the basis of the question whether other groups are tolerated, whether there is an enhancement of recognition and the political value that is tied to recognition, but we can also uh, see uh, whether, um, whether own group uh, definitions are enhanced or are redefined. Uh, most studies of Arab entertainment argue for a hybridization of national identities in the sense that Arab TV enables viewers to negotiate between traditional, authentic and modern views of, for example, being Arab. This is an argument Cradian Ambrose introduced. So pure entertainment as a negotiating ground of modern community identities. Are we national? Are we Arab? are we Egyptians or whatever. The same applies to the field of religion and secularism, although in that field Salamandra and other people have always argued that it is that uh, entertainment is more a tendency to secularism. Because I have to hurry up, I go to the third level subject-based political culture. What can we expect to find there theory-wise? Uh, we subdivided the field in three different levels, individual cognition, individual emotions, individual action. This is the classical social psychological triad uh, to subdivide individual uh, attitudes. Cognition, we are reminded of Adorno's argument uh, and the critique of TV entertainment as a false narration. Neil Postman updated the same thing. I mean, saying that you cannot learn anything from entertainment. It's a false narration. It doesn't explain the world. We have a moder modern tendency of educational soaps arguing for the contrary. I mean, arguing for the exact contrary. You can learn through entertainment uh, to, um, to understand the world. Emotional self-representation. The feminists against Habermas have argued uh, that a feminist, uh, that, that an emotional self-representation is an element of the public sphere, and demotic acts criticized by Turner as not democratic have a role to play for individuals as an emotional self-representation. The same on a cognitive level, the question whether actually the audiences or those who play the game question the rules of the game, and if that enhances kind of, well, how to say, individual action again against the political system. Is that a training field for, you know, going against the system, yes or no? And I give the floor to my colleague. You have another, I don't know, <laughs> seven, seven minutes. <laughs> well, I, hello everybody, so I now continue with some empirical answers. So, um, well, to let you know, our, uh, or we base our analysis on data which is derived from a comparative qualitative analysis of both the content and the audience reactions to uh, or of the German and Arab TV format adaptations of Got Talent, which is Arabs Got Talent and Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Uh, for now, the, the first one, Arabs Got Talent, will be uh, of major interest to our analysis. So, well, in the following, I will present very condensed findings systematically along uh, the theoretical model. Uh, so thus, I will ask whether the reception of entertainment potentially contributes to the formation of a democratic political culture. Well, to begin with the subject-based uh, 
political culture, entertainment reception ambivalently um, is political relevant. So um, at the dimension of cognition, for example, reality TV induces an obvious critical attitude of the local audiences. They, they really criticize the seemingly um, false narratives of entertainment. They criticize the commercialism behind it. So they, um, there is a capacity of critical reading to be found in our sample. Um, especially of the consumer-oriented dimension of these shows. However, the question remains whether forms of this very obvious media criticism, media literacy, um, can be equated with intellectual skills which are relevant to political culture. And in this respect, the data really reveal some limitations concerning the above-mentioned question, because really rational negotiations of like individual norms or values um, are hardly induced on the basis of these real actors in the show. And most important, this criticism is mostly directed at a meta level of media reception. So although the show is criticized as being copied, as being pseudo-real or as be highly orchestrated and manipulative, um, the content is criticized to a much lesser extent than the general principles of entertainment. So. Um, we, we, yeah, we say that uh, the hypothesis of both a destructive or a subversive potential of entertainment is in a way neither disapproved nor validated here because socially relevant debates um, are del deliberated but only to a very uh, brief or in a very reduced way. So. Um, Moreover, the critical readings to be found in the audience discussions uh, can also simply be reversed since they um, also illustrate a rather cliché uh, opinion about, um, yeah, or rather cliché um, opinion um, of public discourses. For example, when the mayor discourses, uh, say, such as television is only about commerce and money or television um, yeah, shows like these, they are just adaptations of as models, you know, then this is also simply adapted. I mean, individual negotiation is not promoted in the narrow sense of a, let's say, subversive reading. So, um, in a way, the arising critical thought, which we can see in audience negotiations about these shows, um, gets stuck in entertainment television. Well, at the second dimension of emotion, very rudimentary evaluations of the candidates gain further political relevance <coughs> since a kind of fear of courage illustrates a beginning tendency of individualization. Uh, so here, a, well, a form of parasocial empathy with individual stories and with the individual expressions really is apparent. So the uh, Egyptian audiences, they discuss the fact that individual individuality can um, well be recognized publicly. And this observation is also proved by the judges' commentaries <laughs> in the show uh, who, well, yeah, they imply that everybody has a chance to be publicly recognized with his or her talent. And in turn, this talent is defined as something obtainable through a mixture of hard work and passion. So the show might improve ideas of personal advancement and the possibility of self-expression, which might uh, yeah, be even linked to social mobility effects or the recognition of professional groups. However, the question remains whether these textual impulses and entertainment really cause social empathy and recognition of difference. And here we see that individual characters and lifestyles are hardly debated. It's just the, well, the artistic talents and the uh, comments of the audience are very well reduced, just like, oh, I like him or I, I don't like him. So they, they don't negotiate difference in, in a very way. So um, to conclude, emotions are only reflected with well, handbrakes on, one can say, and parasocial interaction is only loosely stimulated. Well, at a third level of uh, individual action, the show 
creates a platform for the expression of individual creativity, uh, which is really positively assessed by the audience. Uh, but this creativity, in turn, is highly influenced by a uh, commercial entertainment culture. So the hidden formula behind the show um, is decoded by the audience who bemoans a lack of Arab originality. Um, however, very unknown new or cultural hybrid forms of creativity are not demanded by the individual actors. So the formula rather is variation instead of creation. So thus subversive forms of articulation of cultural expression and a real contraculture are not expected by the audience. So from this follows that talent is not framed as a more creative talent, um, but as an ability to rather adapt to already known forms of culture in a way. And so, well, yeah, creativity is not invented in the fullest sense. Well, let's, I uh, skip these examples, probably for the Q&A. Um, the community-based political cultural aspects. Um, on this level, the Egyptians, um, well, they envision very much supranational belonging. So they imagine a place of longing, like we are the Arabs. So uh, in in the group discussions, and they also re-emphasize existing national communities. So they are really aware of their, or they really negotiate themselves as being Arab or being Egyptian. So on the one hand, we have a de facto but cosmopolitanization of globally shared aesthetic standards and concepts of entertainment. Um, but all this is primarily negotiated ag against the backdrop of national and regional group identities in Egypt. So the guiding principle of us and them prevails in entertainment uh, reception, where, uh, where stereotypes, for example, about the other um, are rather reproduced than deconstructed. For example, the other in the guise of US entertainment culture, the American entertainment culture, is highly essentialized and references of various we groups such as we as Egyptians and we as Arabs uh, are very much perpetuated in the discussions. So, well, the idea of acknowledging cultural similarity within US American model on the one hand and the established frame of Arabness at the other hand also refers to the question of collective modern or traditional identities represented in reality TV. So, um, and the groups show a very ambivalent attitude towards uh, modernization. Um, so they want to be, on the one hand, like, uh, yeah, they want to be um, um, American, they want to be modern, but on the other hand, they want to be, um, yeah, they want to stay Arabic. So this is um, reveals a demand of modernization uh, in an allegedly Arabic culture, which should not be, well, totally dissolved in a way in the eyes of the audience. So hence, entertainment, one can say, stimulates quite multifaceted negotiations of modern identity, and thus it creates a vibrant sphere of cultural negotiations. So the audience groups uh, neither reject nor uncritically adapt to the external entertainment stimuli, like the uh, foreign uh, entertainment cultural concepts. Well, let's um, come to the system-based political culture because until this point we have dealt with the indirect potentials of entertainment to democratic political development and the individual and uh, communal aspects of political culture. So the most important question uh, now is in which way entertainment directly fosters system-related elements of political culture. So when we have a look at uh, group presentation representation and participation, uh, yeah, which are both important requirements for democratic and parliamentary structures, as you already said. Um, in this respect, we really find limitations in entertainment because the group representations here are only latent, since the actors in casting shows do not represent their various system roles, so they do neither formulate or to a very less extent real political agenda agendas um, and they do not opt publicly for political positions so um, 
uh, furthermore, although reality TV includes plebiscitary elements and participatory structures, it does not simulate virtual, let's parliamentarism in a way so the rules which govern the mediated game uh, they are not inherently political because they are rather based on let's say entertaining social darwinist principles um, so furthermore the actors appear as individual citizens and they are seen as uh, individual citizens so they only indirectly represent social groups when they yeah, just when they incarnate obvious social group char characteristics. Um, especially the professional groups, like artists, uh, which appear on screen, they potentially bear political relevance when they stand for secular trends or certain political tendencies. Hence, the question still is whether these forms of representation can be evaluated as substantial social recognition. So. In spite of occasional representation, mechanisms of intergroup recognition are not practiced in TV entertainment, since groups are usually excluded from society, remain largely unrecognized in forms of popular entertainment. For example, religious minorities or even homosexuals or disabled, so they are not represented as a social group here. So. Um, it seems as if, well, the triangle of taboos maintains, uh, so the triangle of taboos like um, sex, politics, and religion really uh, maintains and further supports a meta trend of privatization. Well, um, However, indirect representation can, can be interpreted as practiced uh, recognition. For example, when we see that unveiled women are much more presented in the show than veiled ones, so ag against the backdrop of conservatis, uh, conservative Islamist per perspectives who want to ban women from public space, uh, then entertainment clearly appears as a, with a political vote in this way. Mm. Besides recognizing social groups in the entertainment arena, conflict ability and negotiations between groups are also hardly stimulated. Although individuals and groups play virtual games together, here patterns of peaceful conflict resolution are hardly stimulated. I'm just one minute. Um, the mode of conflict ability is trained, but since the process of intergroup recognition remain rather unaffected and since explicit political issues remain untouched, uh, the political relevance of entertainment as well remains unclear. So the transfer to politics is not explicitly made in entertainment. Nonetheless, one could say that uh, patriarchal structures are broken since the judges demonstrate a conflict ability between themselves and uh, they even accept the veto of the studio and television audience. Okay, But in general, we can say that individual and national representation is fostered by entertainment culture, social and political representation of groups who struggle with social recognition seems to remain a business of, let's say, information-based media. And, well, probably interestingly, even the audience groups, they do not further, um, well, yeah, discussions about political, uh, political topics, so they prefer to discuss the rather goofy elements in entertainment. Thank you. Please, uh, if you have any questions to ask, now's the time, yes. Thank you so much to the three presenters for a very rich, theoretically nuanced presentations uh, this afternoon. Um, I have questions and comments for uh, Fahd and also for Mohammed Zayani. Uh, Fahd, the notion of the public sphere, of course, the Habermasian public sphere in particular, came, as you know, under a lot of critique in terms of whether it's applicable or non-applicable, especially when you talk about application to non-Western contexts. It also came under criticism for notions like its idealism and being more elitist and also exclusion of certain groups like women and so on. 
But also, most importantly, Habermas himself did not talk much about the internet and whatever little he did talk about, he talked about it in terms of the commodification of culture and dumbing down the quality of dialogue. So he had pretty skeptical views on the, uh, you know, the whole notion of, um, you know, using social media or new media or the internet in terms of how far they can actually help us to proceed with anything close to, uh, you know, <laughs> some kind of informative, communicative action in the ideal sense that he has actually perceived it or theorized it. So I don't know if you want to just comment a little bit on what that means in terms of pushing dialogue and discussion further in this domain and its applicability or non-applicability to the Arab context, and especially in the case of Kuwait, and also in relation to your own notion of the rhetorical public sphere. That's my point to you. And for Mohammed Zayani, um, I think you uh, pinpointed a number of important tensions, or maybe I should say contentions, between a number of forces, uh, you know, those who are the skeptics versus those who are the optimists when it comes to the role of, uh, you know, the media. You also talked about the uh, forces of obedience versus the forces of resistance, uh, the, the forces of the everyday versus the political, uh, you know, the discussion or dialogue. What does that tell us in terms of the new directions of research that needs to be conducted in this area of research? What gaps need to be filled? You, you pinpointed the importance of having a more nuanced anthropological and sociological approach when it comes to dealing with these issues and really kind of pinpointing their importance. But if you can just highlight some of the few uh, you know, gaps and areas that you feel are most important that need to be addressed, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> agree with everything you said about Habermas and the critiques, which is exactly why I try and, and sort of retool it into the rhetorical public sphere, which sidesteps uh, pretty much all of those. Uh, so it does apply in an Arab context or in another democratic context. In terms of the, the role of the internet in uh, pushing things further in uh, debate and dialogue, uh, I, I do believe that, uh, I mean, Habermas and, and the whole cultural critique, they obviously have a point. Um, but I do believe that when it comes to the internet, uh, to social media, uh, it's an important uh, source of debate and dialogue. I mean, I'm interested in vernacular discourses, the ways in which people talk every day, but uh, in ways that could have a public appearance. And certainly through social media, that's exactly what's going on. It's, it's people tweeting, it's people blogging, it's people talking through their fingers in ways that they talk through their mouth, uh, but in a way that can reach large audiences. So I think the potential for impacting debate, deliberation, and discussion is actually quite high, uh, but I'm, I don't fall into the realm of the technological determinist uh, that Mohammed Zayani was uh, warning against. Uh, I mean, it's only one aspect of uh, a forum in which people can engage in discussion. So it's still limited in scope, but important. Uh, thank you, Sahar. Uh, um, in terms of the area of research that, that we can address, um, I, it, it's too big of a question. I am. Uh, I, I will disappoint you by not being able uh, to answer it precisely because we're talking about a moving target here. What uh, I have highlighted certain trends. I don't. These are only the dominant trends. There is interesting and insightful work that is being done, uh, but a lot of times it's on case studies on particular countries. Um, I am intellectually stimulated and theoretically uh, uh, really energized by coming halfway. So in a way, there is a lot of commonality between my talk and their talk because I'm looking at the non-political in the political. They are looking at the political in the non it's, it's other. So I'd like to see more of that work that complements uh, we complement each other, and it's that interdisciplinary, that variety, that ec eclect the, the kind of eclecticism in terms of approach. It would be self-defeating if I'm say if I'm setting a research agenda for. Uh, in fact, it is the outcome of various disciplines and various views that that is uh, uh, that is more rewarding. This is really for uh, Mohammed Zayani. I, I found this talk fascinating, but I, I, I'm not sort of convinced in many ways. I, I'm afraid I see it difficult. I find it difficult to see how this region is not wedded to authoritarianism. What's more important is to see how and why this happens. And it happens for all sorts of reasons which uh, are to do with external interference and people wanting to keep 
the regime in a state of conflict, etc., etc., etc. Because after all, it seems to me if you, I mean, if you look at this region, uh, political, I mean, change has largely been accomplished by military coups. Uh, that's the most common form of regime change. So the only major regime change that did not take place through a military coup was the Iranian Revolution, where you had millions and millions of people in the street, and somehow they managed, I'm not quite sure whether they put this properly, they managed to persuade the army not to mow them down in the streets, or eventually persuaded the army not to mow them down in the streets. So it seems to me that uh, in order to achieve major change, you have to, as I said before, win over the military and the deep state, and you have to have a coherent political program. Otherwise, it's, I'm afraid, I, I don't, uh, much as I would like to uh, and hope for it, I don't think it's going to happen. I, uh, thank you, Peter, for, uh, I don't blame you for not being convinced. It took me five years writing the book to begin to convince myself. <laughs> so that's off the bat. Now, now uh, this is not to say that the region is not wedded to authoritarianism, but uh, um, all I'm saying is that there is, that's one level of analysis. But the second one is let's see what happens under the water. How do subjects, how do sub subjects react to that? Is it fatal? Uh, to the region, are we are we locked into that, or there are uh, subterranean forces that are operative? They may not be consequential a lot of times. Is it right to talk? I mean, suddenly people said, "Wow, youth are active." So what? For twenty years, for two decades, we thought uh, uh, youth do not have political agency. Um, uh, while is it correct to say that 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 youth are depoliticized? If they are depoliticized, what does politics mean? Uh, there are certain practices now that are wedded to entertainment, even in the Gulf. Uh, 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 so, what is the significance of those? And then, if you add up those, this, this, this interesting realm of of new media practices, how <coughs> are they affected? So, yes, there is one register and one level of talking about this, and there are established political theories that I concur with. Uh, at the same time, what are the counter forces that are operative? And that's what, what I try to, to look at, are the voices on the margin and the ability of those marginal voices to come center stage. And if that happens, what are uh, the implications of that? Definitely, this is not a normative model. But I think absent a coherent political program... Yeah, definitely. Can, can I re reply to that? I mean, it's an open discussion, I guess, and we were all at the same point. Um, I mean, when I said high hopes dash in the Arab world, I mean, I, I, I am disappointed by what happened uh, in the course of the Arab Spring. It's no pro I mean, a couple of years ago, we were very excited about what was happening. On the other hand, you know, the French Revolution wasn't made in a year or two or All three. Right. And, and uh, things take time. If you, if you look at the Southern American situation, for example, all the democratization processes had ups and downs, and counter-revolutions were a constant element in history to all of them. So what happened is that usually you have uh, a very successful stories when radical groups negotiate a democratic transformation at a certain point. And th this is the hope I have on a political level. Uh, but I completely agree with you that a lot of my colleagues, not so much including myself, but a lot of in, in our field were over-enthusiastic by social movement, you know, making it all, managing it all. I think you mentioned it this morning. I mean, social movements plus social media can't do a democracy. What we need is ideologies, political parties, and coherent movements, definitely. Uh, but I think we're not at the end of all, you know, days of, of democratic hopes in the Middle East. It, it was a first start. It was, you know, exciting. And now we have to get back to real work and, and work on coherent programs, even in civil society. The weakness of civil society is partly a, re, uh, a result of two rapid social media evolutions, if you ask me, and communication evolutions. Because what happens is the opposite. 
uh, of an integrated ideological debate. It's a disintegrating debate. And here comes Habermas in again. You might criticize him the whole day, but Habermas was always skeptical about the internet because he said, you know, we need a coherent consensual platform of a public sphere, a minimum consensus, where we all integrate and agree to certain values. So I should say, I mean, the reality hopefully is in the midst between both of you, between your skepticism and your hope, which can also be based on historical comparison, if you ask me. Things take time. Democratization isn't made in a day, and it certainly needs a better organized civil society on, you know, technological, on, on, on the level where we can be. I mean, we can use technology, but technology won't pave us the whole road for democracy. Uh, in that sense, you know, we shouldn't be naive about technology. I, I think we have one question. I support the last speaker. No. Was, was, he's put a lot of sense. Yeah. Not only he has put a lot of sense, he has lifted the sinking feeling in this room. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have not given up the Arab Revolution. No, no, As an Arab, I believe it's ongoing. And, and the only thing where what we need is political maturity. And that with uh, uh, better education and, and less illiterate people, we will, we, will, we will arrive. The train has moved. The, the, let's take it. I, did you have mentioned the French Revolution. I agree. It took a long time. And look what happened to Europe now. Everywhere there's a problem. But our main fear is corruption. And our, another fear is the takeover of government by big corporates. That is what we are fighting for. The, the uh, one thing good is that the, uh, the, the, um, uh, a lot of politicians have been released from prison and, and the G, G, uh, NGOs are, are, are doing a fine job. They are writing in the Arab media and they're contributing a lot to the Arab uh, development. And I'm very proud of it. Thank you. Okay, <coughs> I think we've come to the end of the, end of the session. Uh, I, I'd like to I, I'd like to just use my position as chair <laughs> to to grab the last word and to just say that I mean my work is very much related to the kind of approach that Professor Zayani takes and so what I think we try to do I, I'm saying we in a in a very non I, I should be more humble because I'm much lower than you are in terms of your experience but I think the approach that we try to take is not a matter of putting the structure against the agency and arguing from the side of agency, but to look at that in-between space of volatility, uh, you know, the kind of slippage in between structure and agency where there's a productive space that's left open in the interstices of uh, uh, power and agency, if, if, I'm, if I'm speaking, uh, if I'm representing your point correctly. So now I'll close it. <laughs> Thank you very much <laughs> to all our speakers.